Hello everyone. So in this pre-lecture tutorial we're going to be starting chapter 15. And chapter 15 deals with chemical equilibria. And one of the critical skills that are necessary for understanding chemical equilibrium is to utilize what we call the law of mass action to construct a constant that will actually describe the equilibrium process that we are studying. And so the way that the law of mass action works can best be illustrated by an example. Suppose I have this generic chemical process where I have A moles of reactant A reacting with B moles of reactant B, and that's an equilibrium with D moles of reactant D and E moles of reactant E. The way to construct the equilibrium constant is to put products over reactants. Okay, and let me break that down further. What we're going to do is take the molar concentration of each product and raise it to the exponential power that corresponds to the stoichiometric coefficient of that particular product. So it would be the molar concentration of product D to the D power, the molar concentration of E to the E power, and we're going to divide that by the molar concentration of A to the A power multiplied by the concentration of B to the B power. All right. Now, as you can see, this particular equilibrium constant is based on concentration. So the equilibrium constant, when it's based on concentration, is sometimes given the abbreviation capital KC. Uh, note that, again, this equilibrium constant has the same letter designation as the rate constant, with the difference that a rate constant in kinetics is actually represented by a lowercase k, whereas an equilibrium constant is represented by an uppercase k. So it's important to make that distinction so we don't confuse constants. Now, let's actually take a few concrete examples of applying the law of mass action. So suppose I want to write the equilibrium expression, and in this case, k equilibrium refers to, again, kc, the equilibrium constant based on concentration, for each of these reactions. So for this first example, if I want to write kc, I would need to take the concentration of the product, raise it to the same power as the stoichiometric coefficient. So that would be concentration of NO2 squared. And I'm going to divide that by the concentration of NO, again raised to the same power as the stoichiometric coefficient, so it would be concentration of NO squared multiplied by the concentration of oxygen. Notice oxygen has a stoichiometric coefficient of 1 understood, and so the exponent is also one understood. There is no exponent for the concentration of oxygen in this equilibrium constant. Now, what about this next example? Well, I would go and I would construct the equilibrium constant by taking the concentration of water vapor, and since its stoichiometric co uh, co uh, coefficient is 2, then I would raise the concentration of water vapor to the second power, times the concentration of chlorine gas, again, to the second power, divided by the concentration of hydrogen chloride. But notice here the stoichiometric coefficient for hydrogen chloride is 4, so this should be raised to the fourth power. And I'm going to multiply that by the concentration of oxygen. Again, note that oxygen's stoichiometric coefficient is 1, and so I would include an exponent of 1 understood for the concentration of oxygen. Let's move on to the next example. So here, that would be the concentration of nitrogen monoxide multiplied by the concentration of chlorine gas, but notice that chlorine gas has a stoichiometric coefficient of 1 half, so I would raise this to the 1 half power divided by the concentration of NOCl. Again, notice the stoichiometric coefficient for NOCl, again, is 1 understood, and so, again, so is the exponent for NOCl, 1 understood. Last example here. Okay, I have this reaction, and so I'm going to take the concentration of the product, 
oops, let me make that a little more clear, because the point that I want to make here is notice that although the product has a charge, 2 plus, there is no stoichiometric coefficient here. And so I would not raise this particular product concentration to any power. I would just leave it as one understood. And then I would move to my reactants, and it would be the concentration of iron 3 plus times the concentration of SCN minus. SCN minus is the thiocyanide ion. And again, notice that this particular equation, the stoichiometric, is 1 to 1 across the board, and so all of these concentrations would be to the first power. Okay. Now, it's also important to note, particularly for gas phase reactions, that I could write an equilibrium constant based on partial pressures instead. All right, now, that equilibrium constant would be referred to as Kp. And so that particular equilibrium constant can be constructed much the same way as we construct Kc, with the exception that I would use partial pressures as opposed to equilibrium concentration. So that would be the partial pressure of NO2 squared times the partial pressure of NO, also squared, times the partial pressure of O2. So again, this Kp would be the partial pressure of NO squared divided by the partial pressure of NO squared times the partial pressure of oxygen. Now, I can do something similar for reaction B. So I'm going to write the equilibrium constant based on partial pressure, or Kp. That would be my partial pressure of water vapor squared times my partial pressure of chlorine gas squared divided by my partial pressure of hydrogen chloride to the fourth power and I'm going to multiply that by the partial pressure of oxygen. Now, I will describe in greater detail in class why it is that we can use an equilibrium constant based on partial pressures for gas phase reactions and why that Kp tends to take a similar form as Kc. But that being said, Kp and Kc are not always equivalent values. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not, depending on the reaction in question. There is a relationship that actually establishes the relationship between Kp and Kc. That relationship is as follows. Kp is equal to Kc times Rt, where R is the ideal gas constant in its liter atmosphere unit, so that'd be 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And obviously the T is the temperature in Kelvin. But the R times T is going to be raised to the delta N power. And the delta N power, so delta N, is equal to the number of moles of product gas minus your number of moles of reactant gas. Okay, and in class we'll actually talk about why this relationship exists and how we use it. But before I end this pre-lecture tutorial, I wanted to give you an example of how we can actually calculate the equilibrium constant. Suppose that I have this example problem. Okay, I have this reaction, and I'm told that at equilibrium, I have the following concentrations. I can calculate Kc just from this information alone. I would have to use my law of mass action, and if I do that, that would be the concentration of hydrogen chloride, and I would square it because of the stoichiometric coefficient of 2, and I'm going to divide that by the concentration of hydrogen gas multiplied by the concentration of chlorine gas. So substituting in, that would be 0 0.95 molar squared. And I'm going to divide that by 0 
molar, which is the concentration of hydrogen gas, divided by 0 0.075 molar, which is the concentration of chlorine gas. And so I'm going to go ahead and calculate that out. Okay, so that would be 0.95 squared. I'm going to divide that by 0.42 times 0 0.075. And I get the Kc value of 28.65. But again, since my concentrations are provided to two significant figures each, then I would provide the equilibrium constant to two significant figures as well. And so the equilibrium constant would be 29. Now, just a note, equilibrium constants are unitless. And basically the reason for that is that the equilibrium constant is based on something that we call activity, which is closely related to concentration. But because of the way activity works, then concentration units will cancel. And because of that, then equilibrium constants are typically expressed without units. We'll discuss that further in class as well. So do the follow-up assignment where you apply the law of mass action and also do a few calculations. And then we're going to go and discuss this further in class next time. If you have any questions, by all means, email. Or if not, speak to me in class, and we will address all of your concerns. Okay, have a good night.